everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin Show. It is your Thursday edition. I've been losing track of days, I tell you. Thursday edition. Hope you all had a great trading day out there. A little bit of a hesitation day. Looked kind of interesting from a longer term perspective. I really felt like we were going to bust through these all time highs in the S&Ps just because they're there and most people are thinking we're going to break all time highs. We didn't. We just kind of hesitated right near that top. Tomorrow will be very interesting, especially with some of the economic announcements that I'll talk to you about later. Uh, today's show is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we've had uh, John Rowland on the program a couple times talking about some of the uh, the metals, not metals, the energy markets. We talked about natural gas. We talked about crude oil. Today's a little bit of a, a change on that, and we'll talk to you about his up. He's got a webinar coming up that you guys can all attend as well. Topic of du jour is covered calls. Our guest today is none other than Mr. John Rowland. John, how you doing? What's up, Marlon? <laughs> How's it going? Um, yeah, good to have you back, my friend. How you been? Uh, I've been really well. Been really busy with my my new my new job and uh, having fun and doing and creating some stuff. And it's been really kind of crazy. I've actually it's my tr trading is suffering because I've been really focusing on my new career, but. Um, well, well good, what's man. the new career? Come on now, now. I mean, I know you're doing stuff with with barcharts.com. Yeah, doing yeah, more. just doing stuff with bar chart. It's just that just that's really keeping me busy, and so uh, it's really challenging me in terms of being more of a, a well-rounded trader. Which you know, you know, my, my world is really kind of futures, but um, uh, you know, I do trade other asset classes, and so certainly. Um, uh, it's fun, fun uh, to work on the, you know, improving my skills. You know, and yeah. Bar Chart definitely does that for me. Uh, it keeps you on your toes, learning new things anyway. And uh, you know, it's one of the, one of the beauties of doing this. It's funny because a lot of times I'll have people ask me on the program, "Oh, do I trade this? Do I tra trade that?" Like a lot of people ask me about spread trading, which I don't really do any spread trading. And uh, I do know a lot of people who are into spread trading. It's like you know what, I'll maybe get there at some point. But th there's so many things to learn, guys. Master a few things and then continue to you know build your knowledge of these different markets and assets that's great yeah spread trading is you know that is definitely one of my fortes and, and you know uh, one of the things that we I used to tell my junior traders is yeah I can make a living uh, you know I can make money trading outrights on a day-to-day -day basis but you know if you learn how to trade swing trading uh, excuse me uh, spread trading you can you can make a consistent living and your guest yesterday uh, Sam who's a friend of mine uh, you know he talked about you know seasonality and, and fundamentals and that's really kind of where my background is so yeah it's spread trading in the school but why we're at it is uh, you know in honor of uh, Sam's appearance yesterday do you know what this is behind me I, I don't know I, I'm, I'm gonna guess that you're up in England or something no no they don't no. have hills like that I'll, I'll, I'll put it out to your uh, subscribers here we'll give them uh, if I'm making guess what this is, we'll give him one of your uh, coveted bitcoins. How about that? I uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> not trade eleven thousand five hundred a coin. It ain't. <laughs> uh, this is the Brentonwood Hotel, where they made, signed the Brentonwood Agreement oh. uh, for currencies. Yeah, this is the White Mountains. This is Mount Washington in the background. So I, I put that up for uh, in honor of you today, buddy. Well, I like your spot. You you got a nice view out there today, bud. <laughs> Awesome. Talk to me about covered calls. I know that uh, it was uh, when you said, I asked you if you wanted to come back on, you're like, yeah, let's talk about covered calls. I was kind of surprised because I know futures is really your 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 bread and butter, having worked on the floor for a while as well. Um, and, and you said, I want to talk covered calls. So what is it about covered calls that you want to share today and kind of why is it uh, an important vehicle for you? Well, you know, uh, the strategy of covered calls in in general is, you know, I just find it so fascinating, right? Think about it. Um, you're gonna somebody's going to pay you a premium to buy an asset from you at a price of your choosing right think about that that is so bizarre right I mean uh, you know if you create it uh, to equate it in the real world that would be like somebody walking into a showroom a car showroom and you're the salesman and the guy walks up to your most expensive vehicle and goes hey I'm gonna buy that from you at your sticker price and oh by the way here's 200 bucks to make sure that you sell it to me I mean that is so bizarre mm -hmm. right so um, I've always uh, loved the concept of um, covered calls right Hey, so, so, as long as someone's gonna—I mean, I, I love when someone pays me more. You know, it's, uh, I got my house for sale, but you want to pay me more? Deal done. Let's do it. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, one of the other things that's nice about cover calls is 
um, if you are using them correctly, um, that you can turn a non-performing asset into a performing asset, and that's one of the beauties about also covering costs. So, so let me just kind of give you a background of why I like them, and also, uh, you know, why I like trading options. I definitely think options is one of those. Um, uh, asset classes that most uh, traders don't take advantage of. I know that um, uh, you do trade a, a lot of options. Is, is that right? I do, but I would say that I'm I'm limited in my approach. Like I'm either I'm buying directional, so I either buy puts and I'll buy calls. Um, I I really like selling puts as well and trying to buy something lower. Um, you know, cash secured puts, but I'm not really uh, the covered call guy. And, and that's why I love having you on because maybe you'll make me more aware of of the utility of it. But you know, I use options for my purpose, and I would definitely say I'm I'm the mid range guy. I'm not a complex options trader at all. Yeah, I'm I'm not really that complex either, too. So um, so let me give you a little background first, though. Um, so in the '80s, um, I was living in uh, uh, Coltsneck, New Jersey. I was uh, living with my father at the time, and he was um, at, he was working on the Cotton Exchange, and he was at, at that time he was was the market maker for. Um, the dollar index, which is kind of funny that you were talking about that yesterday as well, and um, so I would drive him into the, uh, into New York City, and then I was just starting my career as a clerk on the uh, New York Mercantile Exchange in the energy markets. So I drive him to work. Now, one of our neighbors occasionally would catch a ride with us, and uh, his name was Ron Bird. I don't know if you are familiar with him, but Ron was one of the original founders of CRT, Chicago Research Trading. And um, they, him and his partner, um, I think the fellow's name was Joe Ritchie, I think, um, they were the ones that really invented the Greeks, right? These guys are super, super geniuses, right? They created those sheets, those... Um, um, uh, option seats that allowed option traders to figure out what you know the values of all the different calls and puts are right um, and their company right the, this they kind of invented that, that those Greek those Greek symbols right and it's more complex than I know and maybe for you, as yourself but just to give you a kind of a sense of how powerful the tool that they they created was uh, there's a rumor that um, when they joined the uh, Philadelphia ex Stock Exchange um, in the early 80s, uh, when they became a member on Wednesday, by Friday, uh, they were the largest trader or the largest um, uh, house in, on the Philadelphia Exchange. Wow. That was just so powerful, you know. So they were they they had discovered a niche of all of this, you know, this money that was kind of just laying around. So Ron was, you know, he would ride in the car with us, you know, and I was, you know, a student of the game, so to speak, and, um, you know, I always kind of always picked his brain and just like listened to him and uh, what he would tell me what, you know, what he was kind of trying to do and and the math and all that behind it, and it was always funny that no matter what strategy I put forth him or the or the the variables that I gave him, the the answer always started the same way. He goes. First, you sell the premium. <laughs> mm -hmm. First, you got to know how much premium you're going to collect, right? First, you collect the premium, right? So that stuck with me, right? And so I've learned that, you know, one of the things that when I look for options is, you know, how can I increase my income by uh, uh, selling uh, selling premium? And so that's why I've always approached the options market and so cover calls is that kind of that strategy um, the concept behind co cover calls are what we want to do is we want to create income through ownership of stock now um, some people might have already previously owned a stock but really the strategy itself is a simultaneous buying the stock and and selling the um, the call uh, option as well and trying to lock in a certain percentage of price in that trade mm -hmm. uh, of income. And the theory really basically says that, you know, when you go into a cover call strategy, you really have to believe that the way you're going to get the maximum profit is that you want that stock to rise in value and you're going to get exercise. In other words, you know, you're only holding onto the stock for a, a limited amount of time depending on um, uh, the exercise, uh, excuse me, the expiration price 
of the cover call. So um, a lot of people have this misnomer that you're going to sell a cover call and it's going to um, expire worthless. Yes, that could be one of the scenarios that we'll be looking at. But uh, the really the way to benefit from a cover call strategy is you want a stock that is um, either going sideways, a sideways trend, or is trending kind of slowly, methodically, and that in order to get our maximum profit, uh, we're actually going to get exercise. We're going to get that stock called away from it. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. Um, yeah, maybe I might lit, miss out on an opportunity for that stock to advance in price much higher. But again, we're talking about um, looking at stocks that are not performing that well or are just you know, just starting to get a trend going. And I'm not looking at cover call strategies for stocks that are in, let's say, parabolic, right? right? You know, where it's gone up 50, 60, 100 percent in a very short period of time. I'm talking about, you know, slow and steady, the tortoise type uh, stocks. And if we do it right, if we uh, uh, structure the the calls and expiration right, what will happen is the stock will appreciate in price, the call will expire worthless, we will collect that income, and then we'll set a new trade based on you know, the next leg up or the next series of price inputs. You know, uh, you think about, um, you know, some of your uh, viewers, you know, they understand, you know, uh, a trend, an uptrend is a series of impulse and corrections and uh, where we make higher highs and higher lows. So, you know, a cover call strategy, what we do is we wait for that impulse, right? That's going to create the volatility, but we look for the call cover call strategy on the correction, right? So we're waiting for that next impulse but that previous impulse is going to create the volatility which is going to give us those uh higher uh, premiums all right uh you got a lot you got a lot going on there no it's funny um a real quick question then it seems like the group's uh, curious in this one too brendan says uh why buy the shares at market to write calls against instead of selling put premium then using some of that premium to buy a longer dated out of the money call well, all right. So, <laughs> yeah. So, again, the cover call strategy is income through ownership, right? In other words, I want to own uh, own that stock, right? If I sell a put and price goes up, I don't have ownership to that stock, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, you know, once I own the stock, there are some other benefits, right? And one of the main benefits from owning stocks is dividends, isn't it? And so I might have an asset that maybe is rising in value, and I've set out a call that's going to allow me to collect premium, but I'm also going to collect that option, uh, that uh, dividend premium, and th that will enhance my result as well, too. So. Um, you know, I think that strategy would work, right? But again, I'm, the cover call strategy is ownership, right? right? Ownership to sell, right? Yeah, and you know, you're you're basically saying if it gets up to a certain price, I'm I'm okay to dump it, and and you can take it away from me. And you know, I'll give you. A, uh, I don't know if you have a chart up there, but I was just looking at Autodesk here a second ago, and I was like, okay. It's just one of those scenarios when you're looking at something that's traversing sideways. If you're a holder of Autodesk, you realize that for the past two months you haven't made squat, right? It's just been bouncing between 230 and two, almost call it 250. Yeah, it's a 20 dollar range, but still, it's sideways. This might be one of those opportunities where you're saying, okay, I'll sell that 250 call, maybe higher, and I will be collecting that premium and. I'm going to increase my rate of return even though the security is going sideways. So I want to hold it. Maybe it's for a tax reason. I don't necessarily want to sell Autodesk right, for a tax hit. I'll right. keep it. I'll collect that income. And then I think, uh, as Tom says, the only downside is a – well, there's two downsides here. Number one would be a huge sell-off in Autodesk, right? And then you're getting sl right. slotted on the underlier. But remember, you also did collect some premium, so it's it's going to be muted a little bit. The other downside to this is that Autodesk, you know, they all of a sudden become a, just like Kodak and, and become a, a COVID cancer company and their stock goes to 800 bucks a share and you were forced to get rid of it at 250. So, you know, I, I guess when right. you... So it's, you know, it's a yeah. give and take, right? And so cover calls do give us a limited downside protection and there are strategies in cover calls where, you know, if I'm looking in the scenario of a sideways 
uh, stock where I don't have I don't worry about um, letting it be called away from me you know then I might set my strike uh, closer to current price actually uh, maybe in the money or at the money, right? Because what will happen is I'm going to get a higher premium. There might actually be a little intrinsic value in there, right? And that extra premium was going to give me a greater downside uh, protection. Now, if I think my stock is going to go up in value or, or it, it's going to trend higher, you know, I want to take advantage of that price appreciation. So then I would sell um, uh, a strike that is out of the money or above current price and so this give and take between my downside protection um, and my upside potential you know it's kind of a give and take if I'm looking to um, lock in profit or protect myself to the downside limited then then I want to try to find a downside protection well, let's say you know 10 percent you know we think about normal corrections in our markets uh, a reversal of 10 percent is is kind of normal um, but if I'm looking to increase my income through price appreciation, then I'm going to start setting my calls um, out of the money based on how much that stock has moved over a period of time. Now, um, one of the things we'll, we'll look at is we want to start looking at higher uh, 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 time frames, uh, longer expirations. Now, I know a lot of folks might be out there say, "Well, I've been told, you know, let's look at high thetas and short time frames because I want that call to uh, uh, decay and uh, go away." Right? And yeah, that's what a high theta short time frame means. But remember, we want to pre we want the stock to appreciate, so we want time on our side, right? We kind of let the, that, that pie bake, right? So, and think about who's going to buy the call from us, right? And so, um, when we look in that equation, and I know this will hit home for a lot of your viewers, is we want the institutions, right? We want them, because to them, um, you know, buying calls for them is just kind of doing their business. It's, it's the insurance that they have to buy, right? So, they want more time, right? They want their money to go longer. So, when I start looking for cover call strategies, I'm not going to look at weeklies. I'm going to look at monthlies. And if I can find uh, the right strategy where my monthly coincides with my March quarterlies, right, my March, June, September, and December strikes uh, expirations, then not only am I going to find institutions, but I'm also going to find those institutions that are using options in the leap scenarios where they're using a six month short term option versus maybe let's say a year or two years mm -hmm. or three years out. So we're going to get a lot more um, institutional players who are willing to pay that higher premium and uh, that's going to be good for us because that higher premium is going to pay us a greater return over sure. the long run. Let me uh, just further embellish on that a little bit, guys, just because I saw some comments coming through, and also I got a, um, a message here regarding Autodesk. Um, if we look at the Autodesk one here, you know, if I, I made the point on the previous uh, segment when I was making the example of, you know, you could be selling this 250 call. And what that basically is saying is if it gets up to 250, and I currently own it, so let's say I bought it at 230, and I say, you know, if it gets to 250, I'm, I'm okay to get rid of it. That was my target anyway because it was a supply level. So you're looking at it going, all right, uh, I bought it at 230. If it gets 250, I'm willing to get out of it. And someone's going to pay me for that. Now, what, what's the rate of return? I know a lot of people are talking about buying securities like Ford or other companies asking for uh, dividends, right? You're getting a dividend stock. Well, right. if you look right now, I could sell the 250s. So what's the premium on that? So here's a 250 call. Let me go make sure I got this is the monthly. This is the monthly go for to like the go to the like the the September 18. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm on the September 18s. I'm looking at the three uh, the 250 uh, strike price is going to get me seven dollars and seventy five cents. Okay. So what? Right there. Stop there. Okay. So what we can do is. Um, we're going to do a, a cost analysis where whatever the current price is. Now, what's the current price of was it auto? What was it? Autodesk. Um, Autodesk. What's the current price? Current price is two thirty-eight. Okay. So, and we're going to collect how much? $7 You're going to collect seven dollars and seventy-five cents. Actually, okay. you know, what? let's let's do the middle of the spread called eight bucks makes it easy. Okay. So take eight dollars and divide it by uh, two hundred and would you say thirty-five? Two thirty. Two thirty-eight. Okay, so divide that. Right, uh, and that's, that's what I was getting at. You're looking at about a 3.4% rate of return for a month. 
Yeah, that's not too bad for. And if it, this stock didn't have any dividend, you know, you're going to create a kind of a, a quasi dividend, right? Just right. as long as that stock doesn't go above 250. Now the other thing is, think about this: we've collected seven dollars or eight dollars a premium, right? Mm -hmm. And that is going to give us downside protection from where current price is. Which you said it was uh, 237. So eight dollars from two thirty seven gives us two twenty nine. Now, if we went over to our chart and we looked at, let's say, we found, you know, what you call a demand zone, right? If that was a strong demand zone that I liked, then that protection to the downside is telling me that if price got down there, uh, then I, I would feel comfortable going price going down there because I have that protection based on the call premium right. that I've collected, and I also have the structure that's going to tell me that prices are going to go higher, right? Yep. No, and, and, and this is why I think it's such a great thing. And, and actually, what's been spurring my interest in this substantially is I've been doing a lot of work on the Strategic Investor course. And to me, it's, it's just been a, it's a phenomenal course. And there's a lot of utilization of obviously selling and collecting premium. As you said, sell the premium, right? Let's collect some of that. You know, getting almost a 3.5% rate of return in a month uh, is better than most companies are going to pay dividend annually. And here you have it on a, uh, a monthly basis, monthly, of course. Monthly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you're also uh, getting some of the appreciation of price as well. So in a case like Autodesk, which is just traversing sideways, you know, this would be in your best interest right now to be selling calls and collecting some premium. And it could, you don't do 250s. You could do higher if you wanted or lower. But uh, the point was just um, the, the ability to collect that premium and rate of return. I mean, if you get remember, if you get 1% per month, guys, that's 12% per year, which is be beating the S&P 500 most years. And that's kind of the threshold I look for. I try to look for like that 1% to 2% for every 30, 30 days, right? And then that would be an annualization somewhere between, let's say, you know, five to 10%, depending on right. how well I do, right? I mean, that's just my, that's just my threshold of, uh, you know, to allow me to take that trade. But normally, if you do it, if you do it correctly, uh, you, you know, you can kind of generate that in that, you know, three, three and a half, four percent. And like you said, that's over a one month period. And if you do this, you know, every 12 months. Now, listen, I, I kind of do this on the quarterlies because I find that the quarterlies will give you a little bit higher premium. So let's say I get, um, you know, 5% for, you know, three months, right? Well, that's, you know, five times four, that's 20% return on m my money, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and this asset is stuck in a range between 225 and 250, and I make an extra 20% on it over a course of a year, that's a nice return on my money, right? Yeah, yeah. If you go out to, if you do the October's on that two fifty, uh, you're looking about eleven bucks. So, so now you're right, up to like four exactly. percent. Yeah. yeah, and and the downside, if you think about it, what's what's eleven dollars divided by current price? Well, divided by two thirty seven. So, you're making me do math live on the show, man. You know, I know, that's, I know. It's well, just think about it. Twenty three. I got it. It's, it ends up being five percent, right? Yeah, so it's, 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 yeah, four point six, four point six percent. Yeah, it's giving you about a five percent price protection to the downside if your market is in a corrective uh, price movement, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So. Um, Joseph says, did you only sell covered calls on the Dow 30 or any other group of stocks? You, you can do them on, on indexes. You can do them on individual securities. Just remember, part of it is you want to make sure that what you're trading is liquid and has enough options trading going on. So it's not just anything, but really when you have, when you're long something, those kind of supply, um, supply demands, those, those uh, sideways trading action securities become great for it because You'd be sitting there making nothing if it was just traversing sideways like Autodesk, but now you can say, all right, I'm going to increase that rate of return from zero to, in that case, we were looking at was two and a half percent or three, uh, three and a half percent. That's pretty good. And it's not always going to be like that, but I think this is, again, that know what weapon to bring to the right fight. In a sideways market or in a market that you feel is going up, but just not so sure about it, sell some calls and collect some premium, increase that rate of return. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and then to your, to that his question is, yeah, we can do uh, cover calls on all all stocks and ETFs and and even in futures, right? So uh, there is, you know, like you said, you just got to make sure that there's enough liquidity in those markets. Now, 
um, most of our major commodities have great um, uh, options, liquidity, and you know ETFs. You know, sure. you think about ETFs. I mean, you're, going, you're talking about you know thousands of contracts. So th- they're all uh, very liquid. You know, it's it's just like the ones that are just starting out, or you know your biotech companies, yeah. right? You know, those are the ones. You know, if I if I don't get a lot of volume or open interest in them, then I'm going to stay away from them, right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, I'll answer these ones real quick. Um, Angel, Angel's yelling at us, all caps, Angel. Angel says, um, does he use supply and demand zones with covered cost strategies? Absolutely. That's that's kind of the basis of it, right? You're looking for yeah. areas that is having difficulty getting above or difficulty going below. Establish those ranges, and that becomes the basis for buying put or selling puts or selling calls. Yeah, so exactly. We're going to look at our supply and demand zones as my range of probability, and then I want to find the right call that's going to give me the downside protection against the demand zone and the upside income based against the supply zone. So, yeah, that's exactly what we would do. Yep. Right. Um, Jeff says, are there certain stocks that pay better? And the answer there is absolutely yes. By the way, Kevin, happy birthday, my friend. Good to, good to have you back with us. Um, there are certain stocks that pay better, but again, it has to do with volatility, and it's, there's no set thing that says it's going to be more uh, more volatility this day versus that day. It's just the nature of the underlying stock. So, obviously, before an earnings announcement, you know, you'll get probably get more premium because there's more uncertainty built into it. Uh, the more it's traversing sideways, the less premium you're going to get because it's just boring and people don't feel like it's going to move. So, yes, there are stocks that will pay better. That's why it's important to look through different chart setups and see what that rate of return is going to be for whichever security that you're you're looking to trade. So if, if you don't mind, can I, can I share? Yeah, go for it. Share your screen, screen no yeah. problem. Okay, so uh, that's a great point, uh, um, Merlin. So um, let me see if... There you go. It's, it's coming up. I, there we go. I got your okay. bar chart.com. Yep. So I know you said that you had one of your uh, listeners was talking about Ford Motor and that they had bought Ford Motor for... Um, the purpose of dividends, and they eliminated the dividend, right? Hey, let me read the question just so he gets uh, gets his glory on the air. This is for Eric. <laughs> uh, Eric says, I purchased 2,800 shares of Ford last fall for the purpose of receiving quarterly dividends, $420 per quarter. Um, on uh, March 19th, they suspended dividend payments, meaning we ain't paying squat. Now that he's got 2,800 shares that are not performing, does it make sense to sell covered calls weekly or monthly, or should I sell the underlying? And I think it's a it's a fantastic question because initially you're thinking should be sell the underlying because you bought it for the dividends. However, right. I'm pretty sure John right now is going to show us that there's a better way to approach that. So John, take it away. Okay. So uh, I, you know, as you know, I work for Bar Chart now, and so Bar Chart has a lot of great tools. And what makes uh, Bar Chart a great service is these tools are going to make our jobs a lot easier for um, whatever strategies we're going to look. Now, I happen to be in the options um, segment here, and I'm under the cover called here, and I put up Ford. And again, look here, my expiration here is that's that December, right? So we're talking, what, you know, uh, 120 days, six months out, right? Now, here we have the $7 call, right? Now, this is why we need to understand, and and your friend Eric here, uh, you know, he bought this stock, so he doesn't really have any emotional attachment to it because it's not creating any income for him, right? Mm-hmm. But here's a seven dollar strike, right? That is going to collect seventy five cents over the next oh, I, six I, months. I lost your right? screen. I lost your screen. Oh, is it went all better? white on me. I don't know if you moved something or. Okay, mm, let's try this. We'll get there eventually. If not, I can drive on my end, but I'll, I'll certainly want you to get your. Uh, you share How's your that? Is that better? No, no? Didn't, didn't, didn't do it. All right, I'll go over to mine, I guess, until I. It's weird because it shows up on one part of my screen, but not on the, the, the shared full screen part. Let me see if I can get uh, Okay, my bad. No, there you go. There it goes. It's back. Okay. Okay. So I just won't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, $7 strike, and look at our. Our premium is 75 cents, right? So think about that. That's almost 10% of the value of uh, the the stock. Now look, we see this says break-even percentage. It's telling me that what is my downside protection? So um, I'm protecting myself to the downside by almost 11.9% or 12%. But if I go all the way to the right, okay, and price goes up, 
let's say the price of Ford Motor goes up, I'm probably not going to get exercise unless it gets above $7.75. But if it does, I'm going to collect 11.5% return on my money. But if it doesn't, and it stays, let's say, between $7 and $8, I'm going to pick up about approximately 9%, right? 9, 10% is that? Right? 10%, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a bad return over 60 days on a stock that has no more dividend, dividend to it, right? Think right. about that. that now, uh, if I go even higher, let's go to, let's say, the $8 strike, right? You know, yeah, I'm not going to get as much premium because this is not a very volatile um, uh, stock, right? But it still is going to give me, you know, 36 cents on $7 is still a 5% return on as long as this stock does not go above eight dollars so your friend eric who has no dividend coming in using cover calls he can create his own dividend and still own a stock that is not performing that's pretty cool right yeah absolutely um i'm actually bringing up ford on this chart you know and it's um I'll, real quickly i'll just share my screen you can keep yours up there if you like uh but i'm just going to show this one you know here's the ford chart guys and going to that option chain that john was talking about there were a couple different lines in the sand, and I'll, and I'll map out those as they were incrementally done on uh, full dollar increments. So let's go to that $8 mark. I'll put a line right across there. You guys can see I've got the $8 mapped out. I'm gonna put one right across the $9 as well, just so you guys can see that. And I'll put nine. And you know, judging by those, those rates of return he's showing, you may, you may have a target set. I think $8 is actually a decent target, but it's, you know, it may not get there. Well, you could be selling those options, and I don't need you move your option chain on it, but I forget what the rate of return was. I think if you picked the 8, you were getting like 7% rate of return. Was it 7? 5%? Yeah, 5%. But even this is where if you don't have an emotional attachment to it, you know, let's pick a strike that's in the money. And now this is only in the money by 3 cents, but it's going to give us a greater uh, premium, and that premium would, was almost 10%, right? Mm -hmm. For as long as it stays, in this case, I'm going to collect 75 cents, which is going to give me protection all the way down to, let's say, 6.30, right? Yeah. Or six and a quarter. And if you look at your, uh, your chart here, you can see that there's that little gap there just below 6.50, and that is really kind of, you know, a an area of support is for us, isn't it? Yep. So I'm gaining that support, and I'm also creating uh, income on this stock so you know for your friend Eric you know learn how to trade cover calls on this this and, and, and if I look at this 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 stock picture if I'm looking at the same picture that you're looking I'm looking at a six-month daily chart this is a great candidate because it is in a sideways to a very slow creeping upward trend isn't it mm -hmm. right yeah so and, that, and you have that high that you know back from July uh, 6th that you know, a lot of people would be looking at that as a supply zone and want to be selling. If it got there to 750, great, we'll sell the eights. So if it if it breaks through and starts moving up, you'll gain some of the upside. If not, you're collecting premium um, for that potential. So uh, exactly. you just basically increase that rate of return. So instead of sitting there and not getting any dividend, Eric, you could be doing this strategy and collecting something. And you could sell the, I think uh, on John's screen, he had the nines. You could sell the nine calls, nine bucks, and still get 2% premium. So that's probably better than the dividend that Ford was paying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know. Maybe Ford is paying 4%. Uh, so um, while we have some time, because I know you, you like to end a little bit early, and I know that sometimes we go a little over. So. I never end but, early, man. It's, it's, so, it's, it's, <laughs> my, my viewers like pushing me to an hour show. I started this as a 30-minute thing, and now it's like, you got to go an hour. Ugh. Okay, so uh, can you share my screen again? Yep, it's still ahead? up. It's still up. We got it. Okay, so here I'm in a bar chart, and I'm under what is called the unusual options activity. And um, here's where I'm going to blend the two strategies together. Now, um, this is a really common strategy that a lot of options traders look. They want to see uh, an increase in volume in a strike price that is way above the open interest, right? So uh, that's one of the tools the bar chart does show you. So I do have down here, I did notice this one today, and um, so I'm gonna go to this, this is E-A-E-O, which is- American Urban, Eagle, yeah. American Eagle, right? And um, so if we go to the cover calls, and again, remember we talked about looking for a higher time frame of expiration, and look what happened today. We had the $13 strike 
had 5,000 volume in it, right? And the 16 uh, strike had 5,000 volume. So some institutional player has come in and has said they're making a bet that says, hey, I'm going to buy these two strikes because they believe that something's going to happen in, in, in American Eagle in the next, what, uh, 75 days or something like that? Is that what it would Where's be? The, uh, uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. 99 days, 99 days, right? And look at what the the open interest was on the 16s just yesterday. It was only 220. So we're oh. talking about a huge increase in uh, a price. Now, think about this. This person is thinking about 99 days in the future. But I could buy I could buy this stock today at $11.78 and sell the 13 strike, right? And collect $1.30. Wow. Wow. You 10%. Exactly. And in the terms of probability, I have no emotional attachment to American Eagle, right? And what is probably going to happen between now and, let's say, November, and probably even, even in a shorter period of time, if this gets above $13, yeah, I'm going to get exercise. That stock is going to go, go away from me. But in my bluebird scenario, right, in other words, all things great, I'm going to make 24% return on my money. Where are you going to find that? Yeah. Right. In one month's time or two months' time. But in this case, it would be ninety-nine days. That would be complete. And, and that's just a, and that's also assuming the stock just sits there. You know, you might get some appreciation as well. Yeah, exactly. And in, and in, in this case, I might actually go and do the sixteen strike. Now, if we went to look at the chart. Drum roll, please. There you go. There we go. So we can see that that 13 strike is our first area of supply. But above that, right, you know, right? Yep. You know, that $16 is, you know, they're they're saying that this market is going to, you know, pop out, right? I guess. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't see it, but especially this is American Eagle, guys. Uh, we got next week reporting American Eagles. Um, you have Nordstrom's. You got a lot of retail companies that are, you know, typically aren't going to be doing so well because a lot of the stores are closed. So I, I don't know. I don't see American Eagle being the, this darling stock. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't either, but somebody, somebody does. just made, somebody just made a major investment. And we, like you said, that a lot of times these unusual price actions come with, just in front of um, a, re a related news story or an earnings report, and so this is would be a great candidate for you know gaining a little bit of a price appreciation and and or you know if this stock doesn't perform, it's still I'm going to still collect almost a dollar thirty on the stock, and that gives me protection all the way back down to ten dollars. Yeah. And that is right in an area where we, we consider, you know, here's a little, you know, price went down base and then it accelerated and it bent down. So, I mean, there's a couple little areas of support here. Not only that, but, you know, you know, around here around $11, 1130 is where we broke out of that original, that last up, that last downtrend too, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Um, let me go to, I know this is, this question is very easy for me to answer. I'll see if you have a, a, any, any take on it. Um, this one sent in from Jeff. He says, what's the best strategy for cash secured puts and covered calls? If I wanted to trade five contracts, is it best to do one strike price or stagger the strikes? For example, you know, selling the ES if there was benefit going long five track five contracts at three thirty five or you know one at three thirty five three thirty three three thirty and so on. Do you would you split them up like that or do you have a preference? Uh, you know, I think it really depends on the um, strategy or the trade plan of the individual trader. Uh, again, I think when you think about cover call strategies, you know, you have this give and take between our downside protection and our upside potential. So what you might do is, you know, you might do one or two at the money or in the money, and then you do two that are out of the money, right? Um, as far as, um, uh, you know, uh, naked puts, we used to call them on the floor, um, you know, sec cash secured um, puts, uh, you know, I think that strategy where I'm getting paid to buy or I'm buy I'm trying to figure out, I'm, tr I'm trying to get into the stock, I'm probably going to look at, um, you know, maybe just a little uh, at the money, just a little bit above it, you know, or um, uh, then 
below, you know, mm -hmm. a price below, right? Because I want to really, I want it to come into one of those, you know, those zones that you that you like, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you wanted to split it up, you know, that's the way you could do. And again, look at that relationship between your upside or downside protection and um, uh, how much premium and what potential you can get out get out of it. I think the cover call, you know, I might go in the money and out of the money where if I'm doing a put strategy I'm probably going to be out of the money I'm a little bit simpler I don't like to I don't like the math behind trying to figure out five different options positions <laughs> and I would just do five at one I'd find the one that works best just, for me that I felt most comfortable one, right? with <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like I'm overly lazy but if I got five different things on that's five separate if I want to do daycare, I would much rather watch one kid. Because if I got to watch five kids, you know, little Timmy's going to slice his finger off in the kitchen, you know, well, it's just, give me one thing to worry about. I'm, I'm a minimalist there. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. That's, keep it simple, stupid, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Um, tell me about what you're, I have questions. Joseph, who I think is a member of Bar Chart as well, he says, what are you doing at Bar Charts? I know you have a webinar coming up that we can talk about. Yeah, so if you go to Bar Chart, and you don't have to be a premium member to find this or to uh, come to these, uh, you go under the tools section, and it does say free uh, webinars. And then you still seeing this? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, I have uh, two that are coming up. Um, next week, we're, we're going to be talking about just the material that we just talked about, uh, uh, generating income uh, using covered calls. And then in... Um, a couple of weeks, I'm going to do a multiple time frame analysis, right? Where you know, um, you know, a lot of uh, traders that I notice that they do all of their uh, uh, analytics or they're all their, their they're analyzing that on one chart. And a lot of them I see, you know, they start getting sucked into that vortex of lower and lower time frames, and they're doing all their analysis in like five minute charts. So this is going to teach you that technique to, you know, take a step back, look at the big picture, right? You know, one of the things I used to say to the, my students in front of the classroom is, you know, okay, let's say we're going to, um, uh, we decided that we wanted you to go to the moon. What would be the first thing th that you would do? And, you know, you'd get an array of answers. Oh, you build a rocket ship, or you got to have a helmet, you got to get training. And I'm like, no, we need to find where the moon is, right? Mm -hmm. The big picture, right? And so uh, trading is a similar thing. We're going to find the moon first, and then we're going to drill down, and then we're going to look for the landing pad. That's we're going to find the right uh, place for uh, our entries and our uh, targets. So uh, multiple time frame analysis. But, you know, again, these are all free, uh, and, you know, there have been a few of them that I've done in the last few weeks, um, one about a new uh, futures uh, trading guy that's come out that is showing some really good potential um, and then um, I just did one last week I'm out um, looking at the tools that are in bar chart to help you find uh, ETFs um, some um, better performing ETFs or you know turning that idea that you have you know um, for instance one of the things we were looking at is you know in this post COVID world uh, there was an ETF in there. It's called Hack. It's a security ETF. A lot of the firms in there are in the cybersecurity business, and that ETF has really started to appreciate over the last few months. And I think that story, you know, that ETF story, um, is going to continue. So that was one of the ones that we featured in there. Nice. Uh, and I, Jamie asked, are they recorded? Yeah. As you can see on the screen here, under free membership tools, those are all the first one he's got there. Those are all just different webinars that John and others from Bar chart have done those are free webinars for you so there you go yeah yeah so um you know it, the subscription if you sign up with bar chart you um you can you can get free access to a lot of the tools in here but they give you a free 30-day membership for the premier membership stuff 30 days trial and then after your 30 days trials the subscription is 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 pretty reasonable i think it's about Somewhere between you know twenty and twenty-five dollars a month, and so think about one good bar chart trade, like the one that I just showed your friend Eric, would pay for a year's full of subscription. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> I have I have a lot of respect for all of my colleagues that came from my former employer, and they're all doing the kind of the same thing, creating these chat rooms and yep. and watch me trade and charging these uh, you know these big premiums to allow you to. You know, my feeling is 
let me give you the tools. Let me show you how to go out there and fish. Let me give you show you how to bait the hook. Let me show you, you know, where to find the right, you know, where to look for the fish. And the value in here is um, um, tremendous compared to the tools that you're going to get out of it. But John, I want you to show me a whole bunch of charts and call out levels, and then when the one out of fifty works, then you brag about it. Come on, that's what everybody's doing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Give a man a fish, he eats for a day. You teach him how to fish. Uh, he eats f forever, right? So yeah, that's kind of what my philosophy is, and that's why I'm at work working with Barcha. I really enjoy working with these folks. Nice, uh, Tom. He says um, I've got a covered call on TQQ. I think you mean TQQQ, right? If I'm not mistaken, it's the T Triple Q. Uh, and he says I rolled those options forward and up a few times. You know, this is a good example of it, right? You've you've you're in something. Of course, this one's trending a bit stronger, and I'll bring up that screen for everybody out here. T. I'm looking at TQQQ. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but I think that this is uh, the one that you're meaning. The Ultra Pro. Ultra right? Pro Short, which is you know, yeah, that's, that's very yeah. aggressive, but. Um, you know, if you're sell, if you realize that it's got this trajectory, and you say, all right, well, I will sell a covered call at let's say 140. You're going to collect some premium on top of the gains that you're making from the underlier. And right now, this thing's on a great trend. So, um, you know, pick a level high enough to sell those calls. And if if you get taken out, oh just well, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, just be careful when you do roll ups. You know, you really at one point you're going to have to let the stock go, right? Um, because every time you roll up, you're creating a debit. To roll up, right? So you're buying back the call that you 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 sold to set a higher strike, right? So you will create a, a debit. Now, what I kind of do when I do roll ups is, you know, I'll limit myself to maybe one or two roll ups, but I will only roll up if I can roll up to a significant increase in strike, and the call that I'm going to sell is going to offset the debit that I'm going to create as I buy back the other call. And so you can use a risk reward ratio there. So if let's for instance, um, I have a $50 stock and I set a 55 strike and now, uh, you know, the, that call is increased by a value of let's say $1.75, then I'm going to get another $5, the $60 strike, right? So that $5 versus the $1.50 or $1.75 of debit that I created, that's a three to one ratio, right? I'm not going to do a right. one to one, right? I'm going to make sure that I get a greater risk reward ratio to do that roll up. So just keep that in mind. What's that? It was your name, Don. Uh, that was for Tom. Tom. Tom, Tom Barr, one Tom, of our regulars. Yeah. yeah Tom. So yeah. No, it's great, and I think that Tom, you're doing the right thing. You're you're you are playing with fire. I mean, you're playing with an extremely volatile instrument in the T triple Qs. However, you know you are. In something that's trending strong, you're long the security. Why not try to collect a little bit of extra premium because you know that it's going to get the premium because of its movement here. So I think you're doing something great. That's that's awesome. Um, all right, John. Well, uh, I want to thank you for coming on today. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. And I, let me know when you want to come on again. I think our viewers love it, especially the diversity of topics that you're talking about. Um, right now, we don't want to talk oil because it's boring as hell. Maybe next time when you come on, it'll it'll be more exciting. Well, but just quickly, I remember yesterday you guys were talking um, about the strength of the dollar, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, you were talking about the relationship of currencies. But the real reason why crude oil has actually gone up in the last few weeks, or, you know, we went from, let's say, the lo low to mid 20s to, you know, bouncing around in this 40, it was the fact that the dollar had come from you know, 100, the dollar index had come from 100 down to what, was it 94 or something like that. And that made U.S. type crudes a lot more cheaper in places like Europe. And so right. even like where Europe would buy their crude from, let's say, Russia or the Middle East, um, our crude was a lot cheaper to them because that relationship between the dollar and the euro made our crude crude a lot cheaper so um, uh, that is one of the powers powerful tools of looking at cross assets or cross cross markets to find greater trading opportunities you know you you I was just gonna say goodbye to you but you open up that can of worms man I can't let it go now <laughs> Let me ask you real quick because as I look here, I'm going to put them on top of each other. We'll do the dollar index and then crude oil on the bottom. You know, we look at the relationship there. The dollar is still 
tanking, right? In, in my mind, crude oil should be much higher because of the exact same reasons that you just talked about, right? Right, right. The cheaper dollar means they can buy more of our product at better prices, and it's a significant discount. You know, the initial bounce that happened on crude oil going back into the 21st of April, um, all the way, and really the big move was 21st of April to the 8th of June. Well, the U.S. dollar fell significantly during that point, but it's fallen way more than that since right. the end so, of June. But do, but the but crude oil is just flatlined. What what's the deal? So th there's this delicate balance between price as it relates to currencies and in the crude oil the fundamentals, and there is this delicate balance right now. Crude oil is trying to rebalance itself. See, you got me talking about energies. Damn, Damn it! You, you didn't want to do it. <laughs> Um, and what has happened is that the price of crude has gotten back to a value that is kind of throwing that imbalance out, right? Um, there's still uh, less production, you know, potential less production uh, because of what has happened in the past, you know, shutting wills or there's just not any profit in it. But there's also the uncertainty of, you know, a second COVID wave and mm -hmm. that the demand picture is – you know, still out of focus. You know, if we can figure that out, then yeah, I think crude oil would appreciate a lot more. I think what is happening is, is we still have a lot of supply on hand, right? A lot of floating storage, a lot of supply around the globe, and we've reached that level where we're kind of balanced, right? We're right balanced yeah. right now. What we need is either a reduction in supply real physical crude oil or we need to have a confirmation that demand is starting to pick up now in asia demand has gotten back to pre-covid um levels but in places like europe and u.s and in south america and you know all other around the world no it's not it's not yeah. even near that so and we're right there we're kind of at that tipping point yeah okay? yeah no and i i'm seeing 48 is that my next target here i think that that gap's going to close quickly so we will you know next time we have you on we'll talk about that i think that'd be a great topic more <laughs> more more energy <laughs> all right john thank you so much for coming on today i do appreciate it and uh, hopefully we'll get you on next month for another another episode all right, Merlin. It's always a pleasure. Say hi to the old gang out there in the in the left coast, and uh, always a pleasure. See you. See you soon. You got it. Take care, guys. That was John Rowland. He mentioned he's doing some stuff for BarCharts.com. You can. Uh, I actually have the Bar Chart website up there. You can go to BarCharts.com. You see right on the right hand side, free Bar Chart webinar. Uh, using covered calls so he'll probably go much deeper than he did here today that's going to be wednesday the 19th at noon central time so i may actually be joining that one as well so i always like to learn more and more and more and as you guys can see john Rowland not only has tremendous experience in the energy markets but also using covered calls and um, good I, I love what he's doing over there at bar chart so thanks for coming on i do appreciate that also, a big shout out to uh, Brendan Valentine uh, and James Taylor for your contributions to the show today. I do appreciate that as well. Thank you very much, my friends. Uh, what else do I got for you guys today? Um, oh, I saw one from Manesh asking about Online Trading Academy. Let me just throw, I mean, everybody kind of knows. Merlin uh, logged in after a long time. What happened with OTA? Are guys getting the hang together? Um, look, a lot of people are going off and doing their own thing. There still is a lot of course instructors that are staying with Online Trading Academy, but um, you know, because of what happened with the FTC, things just kind of got a little bit more more constricted and we can't really do anything until this ridiculous government entity gets off the back of Online Trading Academy and, and settles. They, they said that they were going to do a tentative settlement and now they're just being wishy-washy and what they're doing is they're trying to choke OTA out. The good news is they all will survive it. We'll come out of this um, looking much better. Just hopefully it ends sooner rather than later so we can get back to doing what we do which is educate and create the, some of the best products out there. So. Uh, everything's fine. Uh, some people are going off and doing their own thing. Best of luck to them. Some of them are actually on this program on a regular basis. They're all friends of mine except for one person. Um, other than that, um, I like almost everybody I work with on the Trade Academy. So it's, it's good, good stuff. I'm still there. Uh, let's see. What else was there? Any little last minute questions? Tom and his, his leverage addiction. Uh, let me go to your economic calendar and earnings for tomorrow. Actually, I'll show you a little bit of what happened today. And then we'll go into what happened um, uh, for tomorrow. Initial claims today were as interesting. The unemployment claims today, that was the number you see at the top of your screen. That came out below a million. That's the first time we've seen below a million for quite some time. I'm happy to see that. I mean, obviously, we want to get our jobs back to normal. Uh, we're at 963,000 initial claims, which was well below the expectation of 1.1 million. Other than that, not a lot happening. Now, um, tomorrow is a very 
interesting day. I don't know which way it's going to go. I, I, I'm looking at these numbers here, and you guys can see the red box. There's a lot of important stuff happening for the U.S. tomorrow. Most importantly, will be retail sales. They're expecting a big drop in retail sales, meaning it went from the, the previous month was 7.5% gain in retail sales numbers. They're expecting it to only be 1.9%. I personally, I just think it's going to be higher. I'm, I'm looking at how much how busy things are where I go shopping. I, I do see that being beat. If it does beat, you'll probably have a pretty bullish day. Again, that comes out at 5.30 in the morning tomorrow. Um, it's an hour before markets open. We also have a lot of other stuff before market opens. You have capacity utilization rate and industrial production. And 30 minutes into the trading session, you're going to get the typical boring-ass University of Michigan consumer sentiment numbers. You also have business inventories as well as inflation expectations. So there's uh, the stuff that's happening for tomorrow's session, and that will round out your trading day. Um, Earnings-wise, nobody really major to speak of. Next week is actually the week I'm really curious about. We have a lot of retail companies, both the big benefactors of the whole COVID thing, such as Walmart and Target. Um, you also have uh, one of the best semiconductor companies coming out next week, which is Cree, which is the best performer of the semiconductor index, interestingly enough. Uh, you also have Nordstrom's, you have Kohl's, you have Ross stores. So next week is going to be a very interesting one. Tomorrow, it's going to be rather boring with regards to earnings announcement. Um, they get bullish. And that's no bias. <laughs> hey, you know what? This, this, Especially this week has been a real whipsaw for me. You, you think you get a read on what those candles or market is going to look like based off of how things finish and all of a sudden the next day. It's the exact opposite. It's just real tricky. It almost makes you want to be an exclusive day trader because of some of the chop that's out there in these markets right now. All right, that will do it for me, guys. I'm going to keep it under an hour today again. Uh, tomorrow, I have a whole bunch of listener questions I'm going to be catching up on. Um, I'll probably have Tim. You guys are asking about Tim Blotzer. Yeah, Tim uh, went and did his own thing, as a lot of people are doing, so we'll probably talk to Tim here in the near future. But I have no guests on the program for tomorrow. I do have some questions that I want to get answered, so I will uh, dive into as much of that as possible on tomorrow's show. If you guys like today's show, give me a thumbs up. If you're new to the show, click the subscribe button. Of course, you can leave your comments and questions down below the video. Don't worry, all the X-rated stuff that people are posting and trying to post other links to, I'll remove all that stuff as soon as possible. But down below the YouTube videos where you can leave your comments, questions, or always go to TraderMerlin.com. I'll be updating the calendar there so you can see who the guests are as well. I, I've been meaning to do that. I've been slacking. But anyway, that will do it for me, everybody. Hope you have a fantastic Friday trading session, and I will see you with a nice frosty beverage tomorrow. Take care.